Um, excellent. We are now recording. This is Wednesday, August 8th, 2018. 2018. I, I can barely get used to saying that. Uh, this is our monthly check-in call for Rex. I know. Uh, and I have a poem to take us in titled The Fire by Katie Ford. <clears throat> and it goes as follows. When a human is asked about a particular fire, she comes close, then it's too hot, so she turns her face. And that's when the forest of her bearable life appears, always on the other side of the fire. The fire she's been asked to tell the story of, she has to turn from it. So the story you hear is that of pines and twitching leaves and how her body is like neither. All the while, there's a fire at her back, which she feels in fine detail, as if the flame were a dremel and her back its etching glass. You will not know all about the fire simply because you asked. When she speaks of the forest, this is what she is teaching you, you who thought you were her master. Hey, Susan. Let me uh, read the poem again. It's The Fire by Katie Ford. When a human is asked about a particular fire, she comes close, then it is too hot, so she turns her face. And that is when the forest of her bearable life appears, always on the other side of the fire. The fire she's been asked to tell the story of, she has to turn from it, so the story you hear is that of pines and twitching leaves and how her body is like neither. All the while there's a fire at her back, which she feels in fine detail as if the flame were a dremel and her back its etching glass. You will not know all about the fire simply because you asked. When she speaks of the forest, this is what she is teaching you, you who thought you were her master. A sobering poem, but, but there's something... Um, just as, as part of our, our check-in, uh, a friend sent me a link to a Patreon campaign by Stephanie Lepp, who has a podcast called Reckonings, which is all about personal change, in which Stephanie tries to interview, actually successfully interviews, a series of people on the topic of personal change. And that got me thinking about the stories we tell and the changes we're going through individually and as a culture and how we all kind of cope with all that and make sense of it and so forth. So that felt, so this poem felt like a, a resonant starting point for, for that quest. Um, we, uh, April and I are in Bellingham, Washington, north of Seattle. Uh, it is a beautiful little coastal town that, um, it sort of survived the evisceration of small town America. So there's still kind of small shops and small town uh, areas around here. Um, it's got a little working harbor, which appears to still be working and doing things. Uh, it's got a rail line that runs right through it. So every now and then we're staying in an Airbnb and every now and then you hear the hoot and holler of a, of a train uh, klaxon as it goes through intersections and so forth. And uh, this morning we're checking out and we're going to head east uh, a little ways into south and east into uh, the forest by Mount Baker and go camping for a couple of days which is why I screwed up moving this, this call and then had to move it back because Friday actually we're going to be driving home. Um, but uh, we just finished uh, the better part of a week in Seattle with a bunch, like uh, uh, 30 fam well, 25 families and their kids, so a group of like 80 or 90, <clears throat> running around Seattle for four days doing a whole lot of activities. I, think, I feel like I saw more of Seattle than I've seen in a, in a really, really long time. Uh, which included a, a different air museum in Seattle. I had been to the air museum uh, south of Seattle by the airport. There's a Boeing field down there, and there's a very, very nice museum. Went there with my friend Sheila Kim some months ago. And anyway, it turns out if you go north to Everett, where Boeing is headquartered, Everett, no, Boeing has a, a factory tour that will blow your mind and a museum that's really quite incredible about, about flight and how they make aircraft and all of that kind of thing. So that was kind of cool. But maybe the, the coolest thing we did was the underground tour of the Pioneer uh, Place area in Seattle, which is the oldest part of town. Anybody, anybody heard of or done the underground tour in Seattle? Bo has? 
Everybody else is a no. Uh, if you're in Seattle, go do this. It, it turns out that when the first settlers appeared in Seattle, when the first Western settlers, settlers appeared in Seattle, um, it was a craggy place with just a little bit of beach. It was just cliffs basically that ended in the sound and uh, kind of hard to make a, a town in. And they, the first town they built was all out of wood and it burned down once or twice. And at some point they have a great fire of Seattle. So the town then decides to take a hill nearby, which is where the Space Needle now stands. So the Space Needle used to be a substantial hill. They took the dirt from that hill and they basically filled in the old downtown uh, to the tune of a couple stories deep. And they told all the merchants, okay, you can rebuild because everything got torn up by this great Seattle fire and all, all made out of wood, everything just gone. So they said, you can rebuild, you have, must rebuild out of brick or stone and you have to put your front entrance on the second story. <clears throat> so if you're gonna have a, a grand archway and stairs and all that, that has to be up on the second story and we're gonna fill in the street. And then there was a big debate about who's gonna pay what. And for four years they filled in the street, but there was no sidewalk. The sidewalk was in some cases you know, 15 feet down, in some cases 35 feet down. So they had a system of ladders across these open sidewalks. And then they sort of gradually they paved over those sidewalks up at, at, at street level. And in the meantime, apparently 17 drunk men fell to their deaths <clears throat> in these gullies that were like moats around, around the buildings of downtown Seattle for a while. So, so now there's a system of tunnels under that part of town that you can walk through and you can see the old facades at ground level, a, a bunch of other interesting things down there. It's a little spooky. It's a little fun. And it's like, wait, what? This is all happening under, under Seattle. And, and, it opens up different parts of Seattle's history that, that, that I had no idea about. So I, I feel like we've seen more of Seattle this time than I'd ever seen on any casual trip through. Uh, and it, uh, it's changed my mind a bunch about the city. Anyway, all in, all in the spirit of, of checking in uh, about Rexy sort of stuff. Uh, anybody else would like to check in? Well, just apropos uh, Seattle, if you're interested in, um, in that sort of thing, a, an author named Sherry Priest, C-H-E-R-I-E, -E, and then Priest, the last name, uh, wrote a steampunk book called Bone Shaker, which is set in Seattle and has as its primary conceit the, um, the search for a massive underground digging, a piece of digging equipment uh, referred to as the Bone Shaker. Mm. And so it seems to fit in that, you know, it would fit in that story. Mm -hmm. it would fit in, very neatly in the story. And then we could shift over to Elon Musk and his trencher digger thing to make hyper loop tunnels and God knows what. <clears throat> and flamethrowers, apparently. And flamethrowers, apparently. Exactly. <clears throat> uh, Jamei, any, any Rexy things happening in your, in your life at the moment? Uh, yeah. Um... Let me think about it and get back to me, mm -hmm. please. Cool. No worries. Um, Susan, any uh, any thoughts along these these alleys and sidewalks? <laughs> yes, and um, to, uh, so it triggers many things. I'm trying to sort through just for a couple. Uh, uh, my, my Seattle story, um, I have several Seattle stories, but one was when I was 18 and I was <clears throat> going from my grandmother's house in Oregon up to Vancouver, British Columbia to do a voluntary service. Um, this is between my high school senior year and my freshman college year in Chinatown. And I took the train and I met a woman on the train from Portland to Seattle who, and she and I got to talking and somehow decided to stay with her overnight in Seattle. We went to the Needle and we stayed too long. We had to walk home. And on the way home to her place, which she has, it was empty because she was moving out. Um, there was a guy in the car who kept following us. And then he got at his trunk and he got at some long thin thing. Neither of us was very comfortable with this long thin thing. And, um, and so we decided to walk, continue to walk. Um, a little more quickly, but not too quickly, and to try to find somebody who was up, who would let us call the police because there weren't any 
phones, cell phones in those days. And we finally found an old woman who didn't want to answer the door. And we said, please, please, this is what's going on. We need to call the police. Could you call the police for us? And she did. And then we went back and they came and drove around the house every hour with, um, I mean, this car did follow us to the house. It did drive around the block. And eventually the police started driving around the block too. It was a rather restless night, but I was thinking, oh dear. <laughs> I could get murdered in Seattle and nobody would know. Anyway, um, that's the Seattle story. So uh, I don't want to talk about sort of work things, although the core conversation, Jerry, it went well in Amsterdam and Excellent. We continue to be an ongoing conversation. The next installation is on Monday. Um, but I had one of those moments flying home. So I was, for those of you who may or may not know, I was in England for a month, um, staying with a good friend and seeing people and doing nice things and basically getting out of Trump land, which was terrific. Although Brexit's much <laughs> better, but it wasn't my problem. So um, anyway, as, as so sometimes happens, one reads a juxtaposition of books that just sort of blows your mind. And so I was going to tell you about the juxtaposition of books because I thought this audience, if any, would like any of these, if not all of them, I think. Um, and it's not underground at all. It's called, the first book is called The Overstory. Um, and it's a recent novel. It's about 500 pages long. Uh, listed for the Booker Prize, and I apologize for not even remembering the author whom I never heard of. I think it's the first book. And it's a, it's a novel, uh, and it's so absorbing. It's, um, I, to describe it, it, well, very briefly, there are many different groups of people, and it's, it's all about trees, about the overstory of trees. And have you, any of you read the book, whose name, I'm not going to remember the author of it either, the one on trees? Uh, the, the German book on trees. The German the guy German on trees. Uh, I have it upstairs. I should have gotten it brought it down. I didn't know it was going to be I can get it for you. Um, I can't believe you don't have it in your brain. Is this the hidden life of trees? Yes, the hidden yes. life of trees. Okay, so and the, German, the, the, the German guy is Peter Wohlleben. Yeah. So I do have and, another brain. I was just looking him up. Okay, and, uh, and, and how many of you have read this? Nobody's I, I watched uh, some video of him. Okay. Uh, well, it's a good read, and it's, you will have heard about all of it, but it has to do with all the kinds of communication among trees and the communities they build and the, the, the intri intricate connections to the fungal system and, and all of that, which blows one's mind. And we sort of knew this, but we didn't really. Um, the second book, okay, is called um, Other Minds, by Peter Godfrey Smith, who's a philosopher. Um, the Octopus and the Evolution of Intelligent Life. Now his question, okay, is all about, um, I'll come back to the overstory in a minute, I'm just leaving a thread. His story is about consciousness and the fact that, you know, sort of saying, is it possible, must have been invented more than once, and the cephalopods are the closest thing we have, and therefore we should study it and understand how these communication, how this worked, and how close is it to ours, and how could consciousness arise physically, and blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, and it just, what? Oh yeah, I'm talking too much. Um, no, it's great. <clears throat> anyway, so then the third one, okay, so this, this is a piece of that, but it's the, it goes in the animal kingdom, the same story as, as the, uh, the tree story, right? about all of that various communication between, you know, how one-celled creatures communicate and they can sense each other because they can tell the difference between whether or not there is more or less of a particular chemical in the water. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. astonishing that we know all this, right? So if we know all this, why are we blowing ourselves up? I don't know, but that's the other. I won't go there either. Okay, so that's book number three. That was two. That was two. No, books, oh yeah, and then the overstory. So the overstory is a novel and it's about trees too. And about, and it's all sort of, you know, and they're little vignettes, they all come together. Their story is woven through all these different vignettes and groups of people. One is about a chestnut tree in Iowa, which is probably true that survived the, the, the thing that killed all of the chestnut trees. And so it's interesting. And then it's a story and it's a story about the great grandson or somebody who runs into somebody who's 
fleeing uh, University of Iowa. And they, they feel, she feels, oh yes, she got electrocuted. And anyway, ends up on the West Coast. And there's a lot about redwoods and trees. And they're just many different kinds of trees. And these people are wise become all entwined. And they start to ask, there's a psychologist in there who's studying you know, how it is that people from San, University of Santa Cruz, of course. So those of us who are West Coasters, you'll recognize various things. But it's asking a lot of questions like, you know, this question of how can we, why is it so hard to change our minds? Hmm. You know, change minds socially. Why do we get into these things? What's, what's all that about? And just horrible, horrible stuff. And in the middle of all that, I was on the plane. I was trying to get cheap flights. So I had a flight from London to... Uh, Washington, Dulles, had to spend the night in, in Washington and then take a flight to San Francisco. I mean, God knows. I mean, I guess it's more time than money. And um, anyway, I watched the, the Red Sparrow, mm -hmm. which if any of you have seen the movie, in the middle of all this. So, so there's these three books in the middle of all this, and it's all like together, maybe you wake up and see the world quite differently. How did Red Sparrow fit into the mix? Um, two, two ways. One is it was about intelligence, <laughs> capital I intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so violent, socially violent, that I, I could hardly, well, I couldn't watch it actually. I'm not any good. I didn't grow up with television. And so I had to watch, I only watched the version with subtitles in English. I didn't listen to the sound. Um, and, and how could, and the same thing, how could people, how could these people be so violent and so, and butcher each other and so sort of human at the same time and how the sort of the whole psychology of convincing people of things and, and ferreting out what people think and thinking you know what they think and not knowing and the whole vagueness of it all. Um, anyway, it was just this, this what, very powerful, strong, completely wide awake, you know, 34, 48 hours. Sounds lovely, thank you. That's a, that's a super interesting juxtaposition. Bo, you were gonna jump in? No, I was just saying, thanks Susan. You, you can keep going with your impressions after you read those books. I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> okay. And, and, and Red Sparrow was an awful movie. You know, characters of the Russians were awful. It was shallow. It was just dreck made for 12 year olds. Right. But I, back to the, I, I feel back like to the it's beauty a... of your books. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was striking because I was, so, I was at such, in such a heightened state, mm -hmm. which is the only way I could watch such a dreadful thing. You got, so, you got something from Red Sparrow that may not even have been there, who knows, but, but, but it hit you at the moment where you were pondering the other books and the other things, right? So, so it came into the mix at just the right moment at that, at that place, it's interesting. There's some new movies like, uh, like John Wick and so forth that are sort of gratuitously violent. And I mean, gratuitous violence has been with us in the movies for a while, but it yeah. seems like it's getting more pointed and more precise somehow. What was that second movie you mentioned? Uh, John Wick is uh, Keanu Reeves as a, you know, hired killer or ex-military uh, assassin who gets even with his enemies kind of thing. But, but it's sort of perfunctory murders all through the movie yeah. um, with, with increasing precision, like he can't miss. First shot, you know, one shot kills where he puts the gun up to somebody's head and boom. And it, it, at some point, there's something very dehumanizing about the whole process. And there's plenty of people been critiquing Hollywood for a long time for for violence and, and what it does to us. But it seems to be reaching new, new heights with you know, things like Red Sparrow and, and Wick mm -hmm. and, and the others. Hey, Jerry, there's uh, one way I like to think about this because I'm a big fan of these blow them up movies. So mm -hmm. I've, I've got to totally out myself and say I like all that stuff. Um, but starting with uh, like 24, I think is a good example of that. I wouldn't call it so much the gratuitous violence, but it's the idea that sometimes good people have to do bad stuff right and you're seeing that not only in the movies like we're talking about you know but you're also seeing it with this yeah he may not be telling the truth but he's got to lie to get good things done and i think we've started to lose that good is good and bad is bad and 
sometimes the good people have to do bad things and it's allowing people to do things like trolling and fake news and it's not just showing up in our media it's showing up in our daily lives i think that's very much in the air and it's you know so you have to make an omelet you have to break some eggs uh sometimes the messenger is flawed there's kind of a whole bunch of rationalizations for what's happening in different ways <clears throat> and it's it's very much in the mix right now um and we we're we've not only lost sort of what's good what's bad but but what's a fact and what can we count on and all of that is being intentionally undermined because it makes the it paves the road nicely for um somebody who's just you know changing breaking stuff yeah a good book on that is um peter pomerov's mm. he wrote the book nothing is true and everything is possible uh taken out of course from hen arnett's uh, book but in there he talks about uh vladimir putin which interestingly enough he wrote almost the entire book about putin without mentioning putin more than once or twice <laughs> uh, but he does talk about um vladimir surkov um mm -hmm. which a guy who has a a job title of he's a political technologist and this idea of fake news and lying and getting people to taking schisms that exist and trying to make them larger um having the sycophantic type of media for your leader you know the leader is true whatever he says is the truth uh it's not and and, and that idea in red sparrow too remember that she goes to training and it's psychological training and that's mm -hmm. what putin's background is and this idea of how do you how do you culture craft the society is has been an art for a long time but now that we're interconnected we're seeing it show up in in some pretty nefarious ways at a very large scale um i've mentioned a couple times on this call the documentary hypernormalization which goes into surkov so does the documentary bitter lake yeah. uh both Trump's by Adam, mentioned it there too uh, both by Adam Curtis Trump makes like six appearances in hypernormalization <clears throat> which came out which, the year before he was elected too and bingo exactly exactly it's it's kind of crazy when you watch it and think about what happened how that played out both sorry you were you were jumping in no it was just I'm enjoying Tom's making some sense of these movies for me <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank well, you. And that's not facetious. I'm like, yeah, Tom, give it to tell us. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you know, movies are the are are the subconscious of the culture. So it's I funny because the inside. It's funny because because of other cues. Last night I watched one of the Hans Rosling videos about uh, uh, fact uh, factualism, I guess he calls it, which is um, how, you know how to see the world through facts. And he quizzes the audience about some basic world stats. <clears throat> the audience gets them all wrong basically. Uh you know, how many how many uh girls are in school across the world, how many how many kids are vaccinated, a whole bunch of stats. And everybody basically gets, you know, how many kids will there be in 2100 on earth? Everybody gets all the all the numbers wrong. Um and he is extremely earnestly, he has since passed away, but his son is carrying the ball and other people. But he is very very earnestly trying to make, you know, a, a very good case for fact-based decision making and and how that how that goes. And and that's sort of the opposite of what we're seeing play out in the political sphere. Precisely the opposite. So so there's this this kind of battle, large-scale battle going on between how we see what we see, what we accept as true and how that drives our decisions. Um which is not only fascinating but maybe kind of urgently important because because it's going to it's going to dictate a lot of what happens in the next decade. I think this thing that's missing from all of the accounts though that we're getting which is again it's 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 very much um individual and psychology based as if as if each of us ever got ourselves all together and right and had the right facts and all the rest of it we would be um things would be better without understanding uh, sorry this is my soapbox i will say it only one more time <laughs> without understanding the social dynamics and how it is that we construct those so called facts that we construct the truth of the mm -hmm. you know and and that that's a social process and it's the same fucking process whether it's a lie or whether it's the truth i keep saying that but i can i haven't quite figured out why it's important yet but it seems to me like it should be important exquisitely important and also <clears throat> why do we refuse to change our minds so often yeah in in the face of everything and and a lot of it is is loss of loss of in group status 
or gain of, gain of in-group status. I think, I think so much of this has to do with group dynamics and a feeling of connectedness or belonging or, or achievement within a group uh, or, or respect from others. And the fact or falsehood in the middle of it matters much less than the group membership. Well, and also, and I do think, and here is a psychological thing that, you know, is the whole Kahneman point about system one and system two is that the value of being part of a group and constructing its identity, like the five of us can have a conversation um, and we will end up reinforcing our own beliefs. And at least we're a little bit able to, yeah, go, go beyond. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bannon's being the political what? Uh, anyway. right. This is from the Financial Times. Yeah. Democrats don't matter. The real opposition is the media, and the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit, unquote. Yeah. And that's completely a, a tactic. That is absolutely a, a tactic for what's going on. Basically, uh, create the fog of war intentionally, make it so that nobody knows exactly whom to trust, where to go, uh, and move from there. Hey, April, welcome to the call. <laughs> Hi, April. Can't actually hear you. Don't know if you're muted or not, but um, we've... Now we're hearing some background noise. Hmm. Still not hearing you, but that's okay. Um, but we've, we've sort of taken a dive deep into, um, well, we went through intelligence and sort of the, the, the origins of intelligence through animals and trees and nature and all those kinds of things. Uh, and we made our way over to the current political scene and truth and falsehood and how it all plays, uh, kind of spinning around this notion of what we believe and how we change our minds, something like that. Anybody want to add fuel to the to that fire? Well, I'm filmstruck. Last night, I was watching a documentary uh, about um, 30s and 40s German cinema. Yeah, it was very insightful. Mm -hmm. was, uh, about basically the Nazis' um, movie machine and how they diverted. And it was very interesting the themes that they chose to do in their cinema. To and oh boy, not. There was a quote from Hunter Arendt. I can't wait to go back and retrieve from it and post. Mm -hmm. There was I a whole bunch, Arendt. a whole bunch of sort of bucolic, pastoral, idyllic German nationalist stuff. I think there was a bunch of that, mm -hmm. wasn't there? Yeah, a lot. Yes, they and going into the past. Um, there was, it was this, their cinema was very much about getting diverting you into some other world. And, yeah. retrieve, and retrieving the 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 Wagnerian myths of the origins of Teutonic culture and soul, so there's that hunk. And all of this is replacing the 20s and 30s in Berlin, which are basically... The, yeah, the Weimar Republic, yeah, party on, absolutely. A quagmire. Has anybody seen this series on Netflix, Babylon Berlin? Sorry, Berlin Babylon. It's queued uh, up for me to watch next, actually, yes. It, it's actually fabulous. It's, it's a detective mystery set in 30s Berlin, with really good, great characters. Uh, the accents are actually Berlinerish accents. The sets are quite realistic. The trams are old, you know, all of that, but it's, it's very well done. You get, a, you get a sense for what was happening in town back then. Hey, I haven't seen Peter for a while. Hey, Peter, why don't you check in? Let's hear what's going on with you. Okay, I'm going to unmute. Thanks. Um, as we are talking books, uh, I'm in the middle of, a, I think, a really good one. It's from a British guy called James Brittle. And the title of his book is New Dark Age, uh, Technology and the End of the Future. Um, and it's about amongst many other things, it's about uh, many other things. It's about climate, it's about uh, surveillance, it's about uh, the part that I'm now in is basically about the invisible uh, in infrastructure. Uh, 
and all the secrets that are hidden from mm. normal people. And it's a really intriguing book. It reads like a science fiction, but it isn't science fiction. It's reality today. Um, and so a juxtaposition. So I, I have been, well, quote unquote, working. I don't work. I just play around. But I've been playing around with an upcoming uh, performance that I will do in September, where I'm using uh, a metaphor of uh, the prison, prison cell, to make some points. It just happens that I did some artwork about that in the beginning of the year. And just today, I bump into a post from Simon Terry, which is titled, Welcome to your cubicle, comma, prisoner 10997. I'll, I'll drop it in the, in the chat box. Where is the chat box here? Chat, chat, dry chat. Okay, here's the chat. Ooh, I lost it. I'm sorry, type message here. We can find it. Yeah, I have it here. Yeah, cool. I mean, what, this is a, a new prison, brand new prison in Australia, which is organized like cubicles. And I'm really appalled by the first picture, which almost looks like a, well, almost, it's like a business class department but it's a prison cell in an open office plan and it says under the picture as with any open plan office the facility has no privacy and a focus on monitoring of behavior and then straight from says doc advertiser correctional officers monitor inmates around the clock from first floor corridors overlooking the pots and with infrared cameras for night monitoring and immediate action team officers are stationed within the facility to provide a 24-7 response to critical incidents. I'm really appalled by this. And so that you can see other pictures if you go through the link. It really looks like an open office with cubicles, and every cubicle looks like the picture that you see on the first page. Wow. So it, it's the Panopticon. Yeah, didn't meet, Jeremy meets, Bentham do the Panopticon yes, prison in England? Yes, yeah. It's yes. the Panopticon meets meets the cubicle office plan. Yes. Wow. Seriously. Yes. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm a little confused. This is a high security prison. So the the fact that I, there's no privacy and there's monitoring of behavior seems to be intrinsic to that kind of environment, whether or not it looks like a cubicle. Yeah, so if you, if you read on, apparently there is some sort of vetting of the sort of inmates that can go in those, um, in those cubicles, but it's just terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I mean, it, I, it's I worse, think... Uh, you believe that it's worse than a regular prison? Uh, I've never... I, mean, I have been in a regular prison, but not as an inmate, but <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, as a Santa Claus, I've been in a, <laughs> in a regular prison. Wow. Um, to distribute uh, toys to the children of the prisoners. But uh, I found this one felt very much like torture. I mean, no privacy and continuously being overwatched. And so if you combine this with what the James Bridley is writing in his book about uh, continuous surveillance. So he, he went on, I mean, he's, He's a sort of guy that is doing uh, his own documentaries and his own research. And he's also an artist and he lives in Greece. And I mean, a really interesting chap. Just was yes on that, speaking in the call. Uh, yeah, for the Isaac of Yeah. Um, so to combine that with the, the prison cell performance where I'm playing with. Um, almost um, cinematographic uh, soundscapes to, to the point of your German film watching <laughs> Weimar Republic. And so I, I found a couple of, uh, I'm using a, a, a software to make music called Ableton. Ableton. It doesn't matter, it's Ableton. Yeah. 
It's and basically so they, sample, you can sample sounds and it gives you a keyboard where you can program any sound to any key and then loop them, repeat them, do all kinds yes. of really cool stuff. Yes. But they also have, um, it's, a, it's a platform, so they also have apps and kits that you can download. So I downloaded a, a set this week for $29 of uh, cinematographic effects, which are really uh, like horror or uh, very strange <laughs> environments or interstellar type of things that you can start mixing them. So I, I'm using that sort of stuff in my uh, performance to create a certain mood. And so my, my girl was watching me. My girl is uh, 12, 13 in December. And she has stopped it. It's so scary. <laughs> wow. So, that, okay. yeah. so at the great. same time, having fun. But, and I, I, I wrote a post this week or last week, which may be relevant or not to the, our conversation. And the title of the post was, the future is not about facts. The earlier point in the conversation but it's completely from a different angle. Like uh, uh, I'm using T-Bone Burnett's famous quote about technology. Yeah. Um, then I started in my, well, it's not a journal. It's a sort of file that I have with open threads, loose IDs. I'm working on something that's may end somewhere, I don't know. The, the working title is Fant Fantasy Compensates Reality. And so it's the opening sentence for the time being is the fantasies become bigger and more fantastic the more reality fails at fulfilling our needs. Mm -hmm. Then you get into, and this is also what James Riddle is writing about, fake scientific reports or fake news, obviously, or fake experiences. Like, uh, I mean, there is this big uh, uh, dance festival that originated in Belgium. It's called Tomorrowland. Mm -hmm. I really don't want my tomorrow to be like in that Tomorrowland, but it's, it's all fake. It's like Disney for adults, but it's all fake. Then there is another one called Bestival, the best festival, but it's all people dressed up like in a, a little bit like, uh, what is it called? This festival in the desert in the US. Um, uh, Burning Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, it's all fake. So, and another one, like distrust anything that fits a two by two matrix because it's an oversimplification of reality. That's what I'm playing around with these days. Super interesting. Isn't any <coughs> attempt to describe reality inherently an oversimplification of reality? Sounds reasonable. I like that, that question. I, I once used two by twos, not because I thought they were a simplification, but because sometimes you just have to carve it up. It's that you have to do violence to the world in order to understand it. And now we're back to the, uh, <laughs> to the violence question. Yes. Violence for good. Violence for good. Was it good? <laughs> it's interesting because Models and stories are both essential, I think, to our walking around and figuring out where we fit and what's going on and what's up. And they're, they're both completely dangerous because half the models and half the stories are broken and wrong. Like, you know, neoclassical economics has a whole bunch of models that we were convinced were actually working that have gotten us to a point right now where a lot of things are breaking, partly because of these models. Um, but whoever yet, thought they were, whoever thought they were anything other than models, a, a whole bunch of people thought they were that the models were accurate enough or descriptive enough to build policies around them, 
and then drive platforms around those policies and then make all that shit happen. And at some point, there's a couple, a bunch of really interesting articles about how Democrats bought the neoconservative, not the neoconservative, uh, the neoliberal agenda of globalism, et cetera. So Clinton, Bill, uh, mm -hmm. was, actually, was actually a pretty good moderate Republican president. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he was. Then, <laughs> who then furthered the, the neoliberal agenda without regard toward the effects on workers and you know, the middle class and everything else. Uh, and nature abhors a vacuum. So as soon as you kind of open up all the borders and digitize all the work, it's going to escape to the lowest bidder. Uh, that seems pretty straightforward. And the loser is going to be the person who's got reasonable income coming, uh, which might in fact be a lot of American workers. So I think that that was a, a, a big thing that happened. But, but all of this, so I, I think we, we're going back to the theme that comes up a lot in Rex Calls, which is what are the scripts in our heads? Who controls or changes the scripts in our heads? How do we consider changing the scripts that we use to balance reality or goals or our, or our future? What is it that we want in our futures and how does that map to all the activities that are happening around us? I think all of those are, are kind of our, our questions here in large measure. Um, and, and one way of looking at what's happening out in the political sphere is that this is battles over the controlling narratives. Uh, there's a documentary se series called Commanding Heights that talks about Hayek and Popper and and basically libertarian views coming in, doing combat with uh, social democracy and, uh, and Keynes and a bunch of other views. And commanding heights sort of means, you know, who, who is going to own the commanding heights of policymaking? Yeah, and I, I have a nice little fact I just read about yesterday. I mean, this mm -hmm. is gonna be a little bit complicated because it's economics. Um, but <clears throat> so the central banks, what you know, what our current situation is because the central banks have done this quantitative easing and lowered interest rates to the, you know, some cases negative. Um, now they're looking back, and we're now barely ten years later reaching full capacity. So as, what it turns out is the central banks were so conservative after 08, 09, they have now cost the world more loss of output than the actual recession. Did, did I make that clear? Ben, did you understand me, Jerry? Maybe you I want think to. Remember. So, so the loss in jobs and output and all the pain and suffering of 08, 09 recession has now been exceeded by the lassitude of the central banks because they were so obsessed with containing inflation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they've now done more damage than all the financial shenanigans of 08, 08 09. Mm -hmm. Now, Thing is, it's so abstract that most, most, you know, most people aren't going to be able to understand what I said. Well, all of this plays out in national austerity programs and uh, backlash against austerity programs. I think it was Portugal. I'm trying to remember. There was a, a really great article recently about how I think the country of Portugal basically said, screw these austerity programs. We need to take care of our people <clears throat> and flip the whole thing. Refused the advice of all of these you know, large entities like the IMF and the World Bank. And, and political pressures to cut away all social services and flipped it and has sort of saved a lot of its ability to have an economy and a society. You know, it's funny, I, uh, I had a chance to go to uh, Astana, Kazakhstan a number of years ago for the Astana Economic Forum. I remember your trip. Yes, uh, it, it was billed as essentially a uh, a World Economic Forum for the developing world as the focus. Uh, what it was in actuality was uh, Kazakhstan attempting to uh, have a big enough audience to sell its oil, gas, and mineral reserves. Um, and uh, so there were a few of us who were uh, token, um, well, I, I was a token environmentalist. Um, and put it this way, Bjorn Lomborg was the closest thing I had to an ally at this event. Um, and if you know who Bjorn Lomborg is, you'll know that's actually kind of a shocking thing to hear. Um, Copenhagen consensus. He's, yeah. Anyway, um, the last day of the event, there was a roundtable discussion of uh, a variety of global leaders, a um, couple of Nobel Prize winning economists, a um, couple of, uh, let's see, the, um, what was his name? Um, Ukraine, you know, the former president of Ukraine was there. Uh, a few other people who were regional regional leaders. 
um, editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine, and the dominant conversation for the one-hour roundtable was, how do we get the masses to accept more austerity? Wow. <laughs> um, wow. With five lines of, you know, the, it's really appalling that the Americans pick someone like Obama as their president. Um, and, um, you know, a few other things. I actually started live tweeting it because I was just so shocked at what was, what was being said very openly. Um, probably putting my life at risk because Kazakhstan is not really known as a friendly liberal state. Um, but uh, so, so the helots are not doing their duty by accepting their suffering with grace. Is exactly. that it? Which is what a good helot should do. <laughs> um, and there was a there was definitely a point in time when you had leaders who only saw austerity as the you know who saw austerity as the, the only path forward. Mm -hmm and wouldn't, couldn't see the, the world as anything other than that particular economic model. And you know, as we were talking about models a moment ago, it's just something that, that the parallel here is um, having a navigation system in your car that follows what it believes to be the map, regardless of what reality says. So we'll, we'll go on a closed road um, because that's what the map says no matter what the evidence says. Mm -hmm. You know, and that conflict between evidence and um, model. That's a superb analogy too, Jimmy. Superb. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But, you know, <laughs> happened. And actually it's one of those interesting questions of, you know, is that, is that going to happen with self-driving cars? You know, so as we automate our economy more, does, do we rely more on models instead of, uh, instead of evidence or something along those lines? Mm -hmm. Um, back to the Portugal thing just for one second. Neither April nor I are on the Zoom chat. If uh, the article is titled Portugal Dared to Cast Out Aside Austerity, it's having a major revival. If one of you wouldn't mind Googling it and posting it to the Zoom, it will be on our collective uh, chat <coughs> as we remember it. And uh, then back to Jamey for a second, because um, Jamey, it strikes me that for the last 25 years or so, your role in the world has largely been to concoct narratives that will stimulate our neurons to see the future differently or to uh, highlight threats. I mean, you've done, written a whole bunch about climate change uh, and other kinds of crises coming uh, and about trust and, and other sorts of topics. How does this conversation marry up with your own endeavors in building narratives? Um. It helps to inform the con inform my efforts in that it's um, it's a reminder of the complexity, and it's a reminder that I have to that it's important to important not to divorce technological change from social and cultural change. Yeah, so that's one thing that worries me about. And I haven't read the Brill book, and I'm, look, and I'm looking forward to reading it. But you know, it's a worry is does he carve out technology as being this you know ominous other rather than being a you know a cultural artifact? I mean, because you know, glasses are technology. A glass is technology, but there are some technologies that have become so intrinsic to us that we stop thinking about them as technology. That is. We stop, we try to conceptualize technology as being something outside of our material world. And technology is our cultural material world. In everything around me in this built environment is a kind of technology. You know, That's what his book is about. I'm sorry? That is indeed what his book is about. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I look forward to reading sounds, it. Sounds like a must read. It's James Bridle. Yeah. Bridle? Okay. Yeah. P R I like 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 Bridle on a horse. Okay. Um uh, there's a term I heard long ago in undergrad, uh, techno social change. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it feels like that's sort of how change happens is that we are societies and we move ahead and we we, we have lives and we make or break societies and economies, but along the way technology sort of changes everything. And so here's the thing that I try to push back on. Yeah. Um, 
it's not just a case of technology change in society. Our culture and our societies change our, our technologies. The changes to our technologies are driven by the social and cultural yeah. uh, demands and norms. I mean, things that we decide to pursue, thing, the way that we construct our tools, you know, the, what the interfaces look like, you know, the, you know, everything that we do we create is driven by our cultural and social models. And um, it's really, I, I, I bristle at arguments. I know this is not what, what you were saying, Jerry, but it, it triggered it for That's me. okay. I, I like watching your bristle. It's cool. Um, at, at the idea that technology is the driver. Yeah. That technology changes and humans adapt to that. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's co-evolution. It's co-evolution, very much so. And, and, some, and, and usually both sides are not fully informed. And, it's, and it's, I don't think it's that technology emerges in response to needs shown by humans and so forth. Technology just kind of happens in different ways. And sometimes it's driven by business models. Uh, you know, arguably, we should all have been driving electric cars this whole time because the earliest cars were actually electric and clean and pretty cool. Uh, and then, hey, the gasoline engine and petroleum and all that just took over. Um, and now but Facebook... The gasoline you know, and were a lot better. I mean, if you look, you know, energy, we still have not come with a... We have still not developed a battery in, coming anywhere close to the energy density of gasoline. Of gasoline. That was yeah. the problem. I think, and Jamea, I'm, I'm, it's just a riff with the thing about technology and culture. The automobile, the width of it and everything we patterned after horse carriages. That was a completely cultural determination. And horse carriages have been built on the same, you know, on the same axle width since the days of the Roman Empire. And the Roman roads. And the Roman roads. So, you know, there's, there's a debate back and forth about uh, just, just how true that is, but, it's, but there's a good argument to be made that the size of our vehicles, the size of our roads, is still derived directly. There's a, a direct through line from the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. which very likely uh, the, the width of an ox cart is probably the width of two people sitting next to each other, <clears throat> you know, Actually, with, with, with a little the, bit of slack. With the two, the butts of two animals, the two yeah. animals pulling the cart. Right. Um, so it goes back to, to the geometries of uh, the creatures involved. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, um, the paintings you did um, about window prison cells with bars in them, and you riffed on that over and over and over with lots of different things. Were you usually looking out or were you sometimes looking in? Uh, and you probably have a bunch of them behind you, right? Well, that's what the performance is about. So mm -hmm. this is, uh, let me see. This is what the prisoner sees from within the cell. And this is what the person outside of the cell looks looking into the prison cell. I did not know to ask that question because Peter prompted that, but that was pretty amazing. Like right, <laughs> right behind you. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm combining it with, um, I think I found it in a post from what is this, uh, Ribbon Farm is his Twitter name, v Venkantesh Rao, I think. A Venki Rao or something like that? Yeah, Venkantesh Rao. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me see if I can open this thing here. I have a bunch of his posts here in my brain. Yes. We but are all is, architects now. Yeah, but there, there is a, 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 I think it's part of his book, Tempo. Consent of the Surveilled. And uh, there is something in there that is called the Freitag Staircase. Hmm. And it's also about uh, narratives and stories. So I'm using a quote from him that is, saying that so then it is uh, all our choices are among life stories 
that end with our individual deaths. And so, but then he gets into the Freitag staircase, and I think Tom, well, I think like this, which is basically life is leading to entropic death <laughs> in the end. The true life, true person's life, person goes through different uh, stories, experiences, and hopefully uh, you get better as you go through life. And so the point of the prison window is a, it's a moment of reflection. Am I standing inside or outside the prison cell? Am I uh, just looking inwards or am I prepared to look outside of the prison cell? Mm -hmm. What's going on there? And so it's a moment of deciding to take personal leadership if you see something happening. And who is in what kind of prison? Yeah, and that's why also the, the picture of the, the prison cell in, in Australia is, comes in so timely. Mm -hmm. Because there is a part about uh, open offices as well. It's about people collaborating and listening or not listening to each other. And there's, a general, nice, there's yeah. a general backlash now about, against open office plans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Tom, you've been... Um, you sort of chew on all these things and try to assemble a, a, a worldview and, and, and bring this in front of people as they go. Um, which, which parts of this resonate strongly for you? Well, uh, in typical Rex fashion, we have a ginormous conversation going. <laughs> so we can all <laughs> choose multiple aspects of this. Exactly. So as opposed to taking that head on, uh, why don't I just tell you a little bit about what I've been spending some time doing. It's and like we'll a rope. It, no, no, it, yeah. it's like a rope. We'll see if it, exactly, see if this thread ends up getting spun together with the, the other threads in this conversation. Um, so, one of the, we're talking about, oh, seems like uh, society's going crazy and things are, are spinning out of control. What, what are the things that cause this? You know, we can go into who's masterminding what, but it's happening. And I've been thinking about the fact that we've really let go, at least in American culture, of the idea of teaching people. Education levels are, are not universal. Uh, we don't teach history as much. And these are conditions that allow these things to kind of come back. And I've been um, a good friend of mine. She's a professor um, at Agnes Scott College. She and I went on a road trip to Birmingham, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama where they have the EJI, it's the Equality and Justice Initiative. Uh, its nickname is called the Lynching Museum. And right next to it is the Lynching Memorial. It's a fascinating study. And uh, she gave me, she's a history professor. And so she was teaching me a lot about this. And when you're hearing about the divisiveness that Trump is, is causing right now, and with simple dog whistles and things like, you know, tweeting about LeBron or talking about the NFL, you don't have to really say, I'm against black people. But what you need to do, what he's trying to do is simply drive that wedge. And it's nothing more than a continuation of something happening. He's just the latest symptom. And going back and understanding the role of race within our society throughout the years and reading these, these couple of books that she's given me lately, it's, it's shocking how, you know, I thought I was kind of well-read and I thought I was a liberal from the Bay Area that knew enough about this kind of stuff. Um, but these dynamics have been going on for a long time. What is different is the, the communication technologies we have. And so the severity with, the, with which you can spread good ideas or bad ideas has increased. Um, if you've seen Brian Stevenson's TED Talk, he talks about mass incarceration, for example. You know, we went from lynchings to executing and, and putting people in prisons. But it's a lot about controlling those uh, sub segments of society for what reason you know it's the same reason you have austerity programs it's so that the, the folks that have the that control the institutions that harness the power and and collect all the the uh, the economic wealth in this world can stay under people's control so I, I don't know where I'm going with this but I feel like I just by knowing more about how what I see and worry about today fits into a larger narrative it's been very helpful. 
And then on a second thread, I live in a- I'll just ask a question right there yeah. before you go to your second thread, if, if you can remember it. Um, but does, what does knowing more about it actually make you, make you think or do differently? I mean, not you personally, but what yeah. does one, because right. some people use it to excuse and say, well, this has been going on forever. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but you know. And, yeah. But, uh, other people are impelled to work even harder on it. Mm -hmm. It seems to me there has to be something else that we're not seeing. Some other way of using that information. Yeah. I, I, I live in a neighborhood with a lot of Trump Republicans. <laughs> and not a one of them will tell you he's a racist. But every oh. single one of them uh, has yeah. these views that we live in a very hostile world and we have to protect ourselves and our children from all the bad guys. And what, when you go back and you look at, you know, Ro the book I'm reading right now is talking about Rosa Parks. And we, we use her as a, oh, she, she was a single woman who had a defiant moment. And, you know, you look at the, the work she put in before she, she was chosen to be the one to be represented in that case. Um, it made you realize that everybody for years knew what the problems were in the South and they were trying to figure out how do we change people's minds? I think that's what we need to do today is to figure out how do we start to turn some of these conversations into uh, framing them in a way that people realize that this isn't the way it ought to be. Um, attitudes evolve over time slowly, but I'm not sure what attitudes, you know, a liberal talking to a liberal is saying we need fairness and equality and justice for everybody. And we all agree with each other. But there are good values that are held by the people who disagree with us. You know, the, the idea of, of um, justice and retribution and safety, security, control, those things are what they're also looking at. Um, so I, I don't know where the conversation's gonna go, but it's gonna be more trying to put your head in the, in the minds of those who disagree with you. I'm really trying to spend a lot less time with folks that I agree with and starting to just understand those I disagree with. And to that end, I've joined the Bible study group, the men's Bible study group here in my neighborhood. Not a <laughs> one of them shares my ideas. And, and they see me as, uh, uh, as the uh, freak might be a strange world, but I'm the, I'm the round peg in a, with a bunch of squares around me. Um, but the point is I get to hear, you know, they, they have some really good motivations and values and trying to understand them. The problem is they all tend to get their, their news sources from Fox News. And so we do have this, you know, this idea that we have two different realities. Like the world is built by culture, but we have multiple cultures that are co coexisting right now. And these multiple cultures are reinforcing their own worldviews. But I really am afraid that we have a very few good people out there like Joe Brewer right now is what he's trying to do with understanding how do you craft culture in a positive way. It seems that there are fewer people doing that or at least it's harder to do that than it is to use it for nefarious purposes, to drive people together, to control people, to deceive people. And so what I'm trying to do is just trying to understand where do we share common values before we try to say my culture should dominate your culture or how do we find where we overlap and try to build something that's going to allow us all to coexist. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, this, this whole question, I mean, <clears throat> during, Thanks, an era, and during an era of polarization of values and narratives, um, it, it puts extra stress on the attempts to find overlaps in values and capacity to work together. So that, that, is, that is like the big work of our time. We're going to have to ask you in future, Tom, to check in about what you've learned in Bible study. Seriously, I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. That's a, great, that's a great idea, too. Engage them right in the heart of their culture. That's a great idea. And it's interesting, the different characters in that group. I, should, I don't want to write about them without them knowing mm -hmm. I'm doing it or everything, but they are very great characters. I'd say half of them are really struggling to get by. I mean, frankly, their, their world is how am I going to get the next sale kind of mentality. Uh, my daughter just went off to college and now I'm feeling more financial stress, this kind of stuff. Um, 
then there's others who are very good, high-powered jobs. One of them works for the Republican Party here in Georgia. And uh, just to piss him off, I've been putting all my Democratic lawn signs out in the front yard. I make sure they're there on his, as he drives to Bible study, he sees them. <laughs> um, but he and another who works for Ernst & Young, I, I think of them very differently because these are thoughtful uh, men with good educations who have very different values from me, very hardcore Republican conservative values. Um, but then I also have this layer that I, I don't bring out into the open because it's, but it, why is it that they believe in these religious stories? You know, that these are, they have some very literal um, explanation is when they read the Bible, a lot of that is literally true to them. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time understanding how people compartmentalize like that. Um, believing in things that could be seen as fantasy in my world, in my worldview. So this uh, goes back, I think, to the difference between faith and belief. Oh, and, yes. And, and, and oh. Faith, faith kind of by definition is a leap beyond what would be rationally normally acceptable. Faith is in fact an act of believing that the thing that might sound like a story or a tale or whatever is in fact some, in some way true. And, and I get lost beyond that. But, 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 you know, in some sense, I think people of religious faith see science as, an, as a similar act of faith. And there's a whole bunch of scientists who are basically believing in the laws of evolution and nature and chemistry and mathematics uh, yeah. as those things all come together to explain why we're here and more, you know, how, this, how this thing all works. Um, so and in some cases, science sometimes takes steps too far, ignoring things that are in fact present but not measurable, for example. So these are competing narratives of faith that are trying to have a conversation about belief, and it's really hard to get down there. Uh, many belief years ago, really interesting though, there are a lot of languages that don't have that word. Yeah, and, well, and there's you know Wilfred Cantrell Smith, who um, was a, founded the Center for the Study of um, whatever religions at Harvard, um, whatever that was called, and has a book called Faith and Belief, and it's it's very hard to go, but it does point out that. But that, that introduction of that into Christianity, for instance, is actually quite new. I mean, the Mennonites, which I grew up as, uh, would not swear. On a, and our, our faith was, was, was not a creed. We did not say we believed. Yeah, I, I just, these are, a lot of these conversations I just set aside and say, okay, as opposed to truthfulness or not truthfulness. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I, I allow that to just be there. Mm -hmm. And then I focus more on what is the meaning they give to it? And that's, that's an interesting part because something doesn't have to be true or false for you to give it meaning. And what you do with that meaning, you know, how, how are you going to live your life based on what you believe the meaning of that thing is? Uh, and this is, you know, often, this is close to where art lives, right? Art is there to help you un make meaning. And whether the art is true or not, nobody would ask you, would ever ask that question. It's a silly question. Art mm -hmm. is art. But it's how we give meaning to it that I'm fascinated by. Mm-hmm. I suspect Please. that your friends in the in the uh, Bible study group would be horribly offended at the idea that the Bible is not a source of truth. Um, you know, a I, source of truth, I, I think they, yeah. Well, the only, yeah. Only one of them is offended because he's a very literal person. I, he, he knows the ark was built and things like that. He knows mm -hmm. that Adam and Eve existed. And I suspect that that... That difference that, that Jerry calls out between faith and belief, um, <clears throat> maybe at that heart, maybe at the heart of what some folks are wrestling with here, in that when you talk about belief in the literal truth of the Bible, to cite any part of it as being incorrect potentially invalidates all of it. And so that and then that runs headlong against the one, you know, what I find to be the, the major difference between science as a system of belief and religion, and that science is intrinsically self-correcting or attempts to be self-correcting. Sci you know, with science, all knowledge, all truth is contingent until we get better evidence mm -hmm. or we get different evidence. And that's something I've seen repeatedly uh, with very religious people saying that they know their truth is better because their truth is constant and unchanging. 
where right. science is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Well, and religious religious <clears throat> understanding has been changing forever. Oh yeah, it's just the way language changes, right? Why is that so frightening? I don't know. Uh, I, I might have I might have a reason for this. I'd like to I'll throw this in there. I call it my bear attack hypothesis. You right. notice, if you never notice when someone has something like that happen, other human beings will say, what did you do? What did you do? And they want to figure out how that can't happen to me. And what I take, I take the next step. And what they want is a narrative where they're safe, where the universe is discreet, predictable, and they are safe. Mm -hmm. And all humans do this. Mm -hmm. and, and we make narratives all the time where they don't belong. I mean, we, we posit causes that don't, you know, anyway. We see so, faces in clouds. Yeah, so what I think is perhaps what these people are doing, God, in fact, I wrote it the other day in my own journal about what I, yeah, is that having a clockwork universe, the kind of clockwork universe science, you know, 200 years ago wanted to invent and create for itself, maybe that's what they're getting out of their strict interpretation and literal belief in the Bible is a safe, predictable, bear-proof attack universe. And all of us want to do that. You, so I just, how about that, guys? I throw that in. So, Bo, wh when are you going to write the book titled The Bear-Proof Universe? <laughs> I like it. Um, back to what Jamie was saying about if, if one thing starts to be proven wrong, the whole thing might be there's, a, in this context, a very ironic phrase that, is, that, that, that happens in trials with juries, which is, I, I think it's called, uh, April will know for sure, fruit of the poison tree which means that if one thing from one person giving testimony is provably wrong, you can discount the rest of their testimony. <clears throat> uh, although I may be we're, using we're, it in the wrong context. We're busy context. doing that on TV today. Uh, yes, all the are. time, all the time. But, but the reference to fruit of tree is ironic in this context, of course. Well, the, the one thing I don't want to do is tear anybody's world down. <laughs> and so I'm very respectful. I like listening to them disagreeing with each other too. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's very helpful. And the, in the analogy for at least, I'd say a good number of the people in this group, the bear is, they, they look at me and they say, what if there were no God? What if we didn't, if there weren't Christians in this world and everything, all would be chaos. I wouldn't want to be in a foxhole with a atheist kind of thing. They believe that there would be no morality were oh. this whole God thing to be disproven. And I agree with them. I don't want to live in a world where everybody's acting amorally. The question is, can right. you be moral without that? And, you know, I've been, I've read, uh, Jimmy, uh, you, you mentioned the, we see faces in the clouds kind of thing. And to try to understand religious thought, I read a lot of the four horsemen and they, they kind of go through that same logic of how we evolved to believe in God. Hmm. Um, but if anyone's read, I just bought a book. I haven't started. His name is Robert Bella, um, a book on religion. It's the evolution of religion and how it existed, and how it helped us evolve and why we needed it and how it helped one group. You have to believe in multi-level selection if you're going to believe that religion played a role in evolution. Um, but that's the area I'm going in is just to try and understand why, why did it, those with religious views outcompete and outsurvive those without religious views? So Bella is spelled with an H, B-E-L-L-A-H, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, which, which book? Uh, Beyond Belief, uh, Habits of the Heart, Religion and Human Evolution, the Broken Covenant. I think it's religion and, and human evolution. If you're seeing the covers, it's a big black cover. From the Paleolithic it's, to the Axial Age. Yeah, I'm reading a lot. It, I'm trying to find out when it comes to social science, if they have a good grounding in evolutionary thinking. I'm giving those authors more credence lately. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, thank you. We're... Um, this has been a great discussion. Anybody want uh, to add some closing thoughts? The phrase that has been running through my head lately is uh, the new normal. The new normal? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just heard a piece on NPR yesterday about how the California wildfire situation is repeatedly being described as the new normal. Um, and, uh, you know, the... the uh, the, the Mendocino Complex fire is now the largest fire in California history, in recorded history in California, mm -hmm. and has consumed over one half of 1% of the state. Um, 
And so just thinking about the new normal, well, how do, you res how do we respond to a new normal? Do we accept, adapt, or act? And you know, is, can we resist the creation of a new, or the emergence of a new normal? Um, and how long does a new normal last? You know, a, a phrase that I've used in my talk uh, in, in talks before is the banality of the future. Mm. And that is not to say that the future is boring, but that for the people living in the this scenario, the people living in these forecast futures, that's normal. It, that's their everyday existence. Whether we're talking about extreme climate change or AI or whatever, we look ahead and we think we see something disruptive and massive and world-changing, no pun intended, um, and the, for the people in this, in these worlds that have changed, it's, it is boring. It's their everyday existence. Mm -hmm. They're used to it. And I'm just, you know, wrestling with this idea of, you know, is, you know, as, as, um, as Tom pointed out, you know, is the new normal simply the phrase itself a, a form of acceptance and resignation? Um, or is it a recognition of a, you know, a, a, a new fact or a new, that, that, the, that our global conditions or our conditions around us have changed in a fundamental way and persistent way? And so this question of, um, you know, how do we deal with a new normal? How do we make a new normal that we want? That's, that's what I've been... So if I, if I can just try to end this on a more positive note and kind of wrap it up with a reference to something I was saying earlier. Are you going to show a puppies and kittens video on YouTube? Oh my God, the, the reading what it was like to grow up in the South as a black person in the 40s or 50s, it was oh, just, God. it was atrocious. Yeah. But at one point, they started to have a new normal. They started to realize that they actually could make some changes. And so, you know, there was a trial where um, uh, it, it was very common that black men would rape women and they wouldn't even be charged with anything. You know, it was just, cons the cops are all part of the KKK and they just, they knew the guys and so they just let them go. But there was, they had one case of these men were put on trial. Six white men were all tried and it took them three years just to get the charges brought. And they kept fighting and they kept persisting and they saw justice and these men went to prison. 37 black men had been executed by uh, electric chair in Mississippi for raping white women. Not a single white man had gone to prison. Now these six, none of them got executed, but at least they all got put into prison for life. And when people saw that their efforts had a result like that, it started to give them the ability to realize that putting effort into other changes was worthwhile. And it's a slow slog, you know, to, when you're going against the dominant culture, you're not gonna change it overnight. But these types of small moves, when we can start to see that maybe there's a way to get out of this authoritarian state we're in right now, what is going to be that moment where we realize that maybe Mueller's gonna be the person that shows us that the you know, emperor has no clothes. Um, thank, thank you. That, that thanks, despite, Tom. Just, <laughs> despite being a very painful story, was in fact optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always use rape stories to bring people up. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> any other closing thoughts? Uh, one, yeah. one small thought Please. is that um, across the world's languages, um, the future tense, that they're, they're, the past non past distinction is far more profound than past, present, and future. Just to go back to mm -hmm. um, that earlier comment. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, to me, it's not so surprising that it's, that now, now extends into the future. And, and it is unknowable. You gotta watch the movie Arrival. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a linguistic science fiction, right? Or science fiction with a strong linguistic element. Actually, a lot of people say your language determines how you think. 
Mm-hmm. And oh this, yeah, 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 and yeah. This yeah, actually yeah. relates we to the audio that. We went through that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. This has been fantastic. Uh, have a great August. I'll see you on a pop-up call soon. Uh, if you have pop-up call topics, let me know. We'll make them happen, whatever comes up in your heads. And uh, for now, thank you. This has got lots in my head. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.